I'm Pam from the Shreveport Regional Arts Council. I'd like to introduce Henry Price, the president of the Shreveport Regional Arts Council. Henry, I know you're back there. Will you wave and raise your hand and say hey to everybody? Hi. And Joe Kane, the president of the Art Space Board. Joe, are you all the way in the back right there? All the way to the back. Thank you, Joe. This is a very exciting, okay, as Archie Bunker would say, stifle yourselves, please, and let us have a chance to tell you. Is the music still on? I, I feel like I, LJ, I think the music is on overhead. Can we turn that off? LJ, the director for Art Space, right the back of me. Is the music off? Okay. Megan Porter, I know, is in the building, our exhibition director right back here. Thank you very much, Megan. All right, I still hear music. Do you all hear music? Do I hear music? Okay, good. Now, this is for the Shreveport Regional Arts Council and even for Bill Joyce, a 180 degrees evening. It is a, not just because it's hot outside either. This represents the full circle, and only a person in the arts would know that 180 degrees is not a full circle, that it actually takes 360 degrees to get all the way around to what you're trying to say. When we think back on the life of Epic in this Shreveport, Bossier, and Ruston, North Louisiana community, that it was in 1996 when this fantastic book, The Leafman and the Brave Good Bugs, had been produced. It was beautiful. And Bill came to the Shreveport Regional Arts Council and said, hey, let's make a play. And we said, gosh, we would sure need some money. And the National Endowment for the Arts said, this is a project that will put Shreveport artistically on the map. Now there's a lot of things about coming 360 and I want to make some of those announcements that really all started when one artist in our community was recognized to have the caliber of receiving the attention of the National Endowment for the Arts and our hope that in a year, lots and lots of artists are going to be receiving the attention of the National Endowment for the Arts. And Shreveport, Bossier, Northwest Louisiana is going to move forward exponentially. But, back in 1996, just one second. I'm fighting. I know I'm fighting. I'm asking to be quiet over there or go to the third floor. We can go to the third floor if we want to visit feel like an old school teacher all of a sudden, but I do have to tell you that in 1996 when Bill said, let's do a play, and we said, let's go to the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, we got a very big grant to produce the play. And ever since then, Shreveport has been getting very big grants from the NEA. I don't even know if Bill knows that this week we were told that we we're going to receive a $150,000 grant to produce a new event called Unseen. Very exciting. But you've got to get on that map. And you've got to get on that national map by doing it with people who are right here. And the fact that Bill, in 1996, said, let's do a major work in this community, and that work was the theatrical production, The Leafman and the Brave Good Bugs at the Strand Theater, a very magical night, which again, since then, Bill's done three other major things to involve the Strand Theater and make sure that great works start right here at home, new works start right here at home. And this journey to see a book become a play, become a movie with international acclaim. Everywhere you've gone in the month of May, every country you've been in has promoted Epic. And so for us to have this rich talent right here and to be able tonight to share in this journey with Bill, 
is a major feat, and I want you all to give him a big round of applause before he says a word. Now, normally in a crowd like this, I like to ask questions and throw out prizes, like who can remember some of his books? Santa Calls, Dinosaur Bob, do you have them in your home collection? Do you have some of these great books? How many of you were raised on Roly Polioli? Three Emmy Awards. Raise your hand up if you, there you go. Of course, hopefully, many of you have seen the movie Robots, or you saw A Day in the Life of Wilbur Robinson, or you've seen, uh-huh. And how many of you are with us to see Rise of the Guardians? Raise your hands up high, there we go. In, in all of this, for art space, and particularly for the Shreveport Regional Arts Council, the fact that not only has Bill made a choice to stay in Shreveport, make his living here, form a company with two other greats of our community, Brandon Oldenburg and Landon Enox, Moonbot Studios, a company that now employs 50 artists, 50 artists, yes, that's here. Many of you are artists with Moonbot. Would you stand up or raise your hand, artists with Moonbot Studios? Thank you very much. Really but not only has he done all of this, but he has also given the gift since 2004 of being the pro bono. Anyone under the age of 10 not know what pro bono means? It means free. He has provided his services free as the artistic director here of Art Space, ensuring that you always experience something miraculous, unanticipated, and wonderful. Let's give Bill Joyce a big hand. Thank you, Bill. Pam, you, you, you used up my first glass of wine in the introduction. <laughs> well, settle in, folks. It's a long story. There we go. I'm killing Pam. me to um, talk about the process of how Epic came to be a motion picture. And, you know, it's, anytime you do one of these movies, it's, it takes so much longer than you think is possible. You go into these things thinking, I'm going to make a movie, you know, and in a few years I'll see it, maybe two Two years, my kids will see it. I want to make a movie for my kids, you know, kind of thing. Well, I started this in 1994, <laughs> you know, and it was for my kids. Um, it was summer. It was about this time of the year, and the kids were really small then. They were like uh, first grade, second grade, and. They were playing outside all day long, and we had this big dirt pile on the side of our yard. It was one of the smartest toy purchases I ever made. And just said, get a dump truck to come and dump a load of dirt on the side of our yard. Because when I was a kid, I mean, whenever you went, like, there's a construction site, there's piles of dirt. It's like, oh, my God. This is golden. And so, you know, I was just like, just, this is good truckload of dirt, you know, and they'll play in it all summer, and it'll be awesome, and then we'll spread the dirt around, but, you know, and so, a pile of dirt comes, it costs 60 bucks, if, in case you're wondering, but that was in 93, so, but it might, maybe it's 100 bucks now, but, so for all that summer, I mean, they'd be out there playing all night long, you know, until long past dark, and they'd be filthy, and they look like mud dwellers at the end of this thing. And it was in the twilight, and in, right after the end of twilight, in the evening, uh, the lights of the house would be illuminating the yard. 
And so anything that was that had wings, insect, you know, insect toys that had wings and was flying around in that light looked like a fairy to them. And so we sit out there with them and, and my daughter would go, is that a fairy? You know, it'd be like a mayfly or something. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's awesome. And then they'd stand out there for a long time and go, look, there's another one, there's another one. And then fireflies would come in and talk. And so I started making up these stories that like fireflies had a secret like Morse code language that they used to communicate with the fairies and the fairies sent messages to each other. So there's all this stuff that's kind of going on in my head. I was supposed to be finishing a book called Billy's Booger at, at the time. And I've been working on it since the second grade. And, uh, it didn't have a publisher yet, anyway. or at least in the second grade it did. But it did in 1993. So there's a deadline, and I was supposed to like finish this book this summer, next summer. But I found myself like thinking about you know being in the yard, and being with the kids, and little realms of little people that you couldn't see, and. Then my daughter and her best friend, Eleanor, who lived next door, started building these little fairy villages in the, not just the dirt pile, but in the bushes and all over the place. So we had this like fairy metropolis. And they would make it out of sticks, and they would make it out of mud, and they would find, they, their whole thing was that, that moss was fairy grass. And moss was the most, you know, essential product to any fairy structure. And so it just kept growing like this. And, and so we'd buy little birdhouses and they were glue gunning moss to the, to the birdhouses. And then I was getting into it, like sand and stuff, you know, carbon stuff. And then we started finding little, little dolls here and there in some of the antique stores around town and pasting wings on them. And those, they all had names. And so I just got this bigger and bigger thing. So one night, one of those nights when you know you're it's you're balancing between when you're a parent in those like first years of being a parent or those middle years I guess I don't know and you're you know I had deadlines and I was working like crazy but then it was like daddy 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 can we you know, play in the yard tell us fairy stories da, 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 da. and so at the end of the day I'm just exhausted I'm like brain dead. And so it's tuck-in time, and I'm tucking them both in, and they're like, tell us a story, tell us a story, and I'm like, okay. And I, I, I was too tired to get up and like grab a book even that I had written or anybody else had written. <laughs> and so I'm just laying there, and like my eyes are shutting as I just start going, well, you know, there are these little guys called the Leaf Men. And I just started telling this tale, and it came out almost exactly as it is in the book, I mean, that night. And I wasn't thinking about it at all. It was like weariness, exhaustion, wanting to fall asleep. I was, I was putting myself to sleep with this, this story that would become this movie. And, but they really liked it. And they talked about it the next day. And I remember going, I'm like, try to remember what you just said, because it, was, it wasn't bad, you know? <laughs> And, uh, but you know, the next morning I was kind of fuzzy on a few of the details, but they filled me in. They were like, they remembered really well all the stuff that happened in the book. So I sat down and instead of drawing these boogers for Billy's booger, these boogers with superpowers, <laughs> Billy gets hit in the head by a meteorite, the, the main character of this, this story, and his boogers get superpowers. <laughs> and so instead of painting boogers, um, I just started painting this little leaf man. I, I called him a leaf man. He was like, I don't know, just came out. And, you know, he had a sword and he had like a shield that was made of a leaf. And, you know, I was like, I don't know what is going on here. But it's real. I really think this is awesome. And so, my friend, a friend of mine, Stanton Dawson, the third, whose kids were about the same age as mine. And, Stan had moved back and he's in the theater and I said, Stan, come over to the house. I, I, I got this crazy idea. And he's like, okay. And, and uh, he's like, like, it's the middle of the day and I'm like, look at the dirt pile. Look at, look, you know, the side of our yard's really cool. It's got all these trees and stuff. And 
what if we put on a play? Like, I thought of this crazy little story about these little guys that live in, the, in your garden, that, that keep the garden safe, little warriors. And it'd be a great little like Midsummer Night's Dream thing. For, that we'd put on a play with our own kids and their friends. And we'd like use flashlights. And he was really just a totally little kid, like innocent, you know, thing that we would just do in our yard. And he goes, well, it sounds awesome. It sounds like an awesome story, though. It, it, do you want to do a book ad? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do a book ad. i got to do this booger book. And, um, <laughs> but wouldn't it be fun to do this thing? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then we're kind of like scratching our chest like, yeah, wouldn't it be great if like Shrek could give us some money to do this? Like, then we could like get real costumes and stuff. And Stanton goes, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go talk to Pam. And, um, and I knew Pam a little bit, but I didn't know her that well at that point. And, uh, and Stanton kept saying, are you sure you don't want to do a book out of this? I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just going to be a play in the yard with the kids. And so we sit down with Pam and like, <laughs> This is, this is like a definitive Pam moment, like in, in the encyclopedia of Pam, you know, there's how things happen and then they get bigger, right? Like, you know, hey, let's, let's see if we can have an art space. Let's get free buildings and raise five million dollars. <laughs> and it'll happen like that, you know? So, I got, so Pam's like, so what are you guys thinking about? I'm like, well, we want to do this play in our yard with our kids about these leaf men. And, and I had like one picture that I had drawn. And, uh, and we want to do it on the midsummer night and the solstice. And, you know, that's in a few weeks. And, uh, and so, you know, I don't know. Can you give us like a thousand bucks or something? Like, we could get some of the artists in town to maybe help out. And she goes, she just kind of sat there like really quiet. And, uh. I think that's when the gray streaks started. <laughs> but she goes, well, I think we should aim a little bigger. And I'm like, mm, like what? She goes, well, I think that we should put on a, a show at the Strand Theater. I think we should go for a grant of $300,000 in the National Endowment of the Arts. We've never gotten a nickel from them, but this might work. And I'm like, well, what about the kids in the yard? She goes, awesome, yes, of course, eventually, sometime. <laughs> but while you guys are maybe playing, playing in your yard, I'd like to apply for grants. And we said, oh, Stan and I kind of looked at each other, and I'm like, well, no downside to that, huh? <laughs> and, and then it sort of like, I got back home, didn't think about it, except that I kept painting leaf men. And my editor is calling from New York going, so how are the boogers doing? And I'm like, well, they, they're still green. <laughs> but now they got little swords and leaves and things. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, I kind of came up with this other story. And I really, I don't know, I'm really into it. And, and, and I think it could be an awesome book. And I think I could get it done really fast. And she's like, well, you have to because, you know, you have a book due and you have it due in three months, and you've never done a book that fast, and I'm like, well, I know, but you know, I really want to try this, and I really think it can work. And so I sent her like, these little dinky drawings that laid the book out, with the text pretty much the way it is, and pretty much the way I told her that exhausted night, and she goes, oh my god, it's, it's the loveliest thing you've written, and so go, just paint your heart up, and you know, go as fast as you can. So, that's what I'm doing. And, but we don't ever get around to doing the play in the yard with the kids. And the kids are kind of like, what happened to the, aren't we going to have like flashlights and stuff? Or, I'm like, yeah, hey, don't worry about it. We'll get to that sometime. And then Pam, like, I don't know, I can't remember like the timeline specifically, but then Pam calls up one day and she goes, well, good news. We've got a $300,000 grant. <laughs> so we have to do this now. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Pam, I've never done a play. And she's like, well, you're going to learn. <laughs> so, $300,000 is a lot of money. And so, I spent every nickel of it. It was awesome. I mean, you know, I write this thing as a play, 
never written a play. I write it as a play and a musical, which I detest musicals, and yet I'm writing one. I mean, I don't detest musicals entirely. I just think that 98% of them make me want to run from the theater and kill people, <laughs> especially musical theater people. And, I mean, I'm not, I know it's being really mean, but, you know, there's just that whole put on a show thing that just gives me the creeps. And so I'm like, if we can kind of make it like The Wizard of Oz, like where it doesn't feel like the songs stop the action and then you've got this big production number that you have to log for her Ray, look like they were all high kicking, wow, kind of thing. Where it's just like, you know, we got some little munchkins that start singing, of course they sing, you know. So I think that can work for Leafman. I think that, you know, we're, it's called the Leafman and the Brave Good Bugs. I've got a bunch of blue insects that are on this journey to ride along the forest and uh, they seem munchkin-like, they can sing. So, we start writing this thing and then we start doing all the stuff you have to do to make a play. And, you know, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so by the time it came, it premiered, we had a cast of a hundred people, which is insane. If I mean, most Broadway shows have like 20 tops. We had a hundred people in this show. A hundred and 75 costumes. I mean, we built these giant sets of giant tree limbs and giant cans of raid to fight the bugs were fighting each other with, and, you know, these ant goblins that were throwing spears, and we had seven leaf men that, were, that flew through the air, right? So we had to, like, bring in these guys from Las Vegas, fly them, you know, fly like people for Cirque du Soleil and stuff. And they put the pulleys on you so you kind of look like you are flying on your own, but you really go, oh, check out the wire that he's hanging from. And, but, you know, the guys who fly Peter Pan, I mean, Peter Pan production. So we had to bring in these, and they cost a ton to bring in these flymen. And we had to teach these seven high school and college kids and one eight-year-old boy how to fly 25, 30 feet in the air and swoop around the stage of the, um, the Strand Theater, defending the good bugs and sword fighting against the, um, the, uh, the ant goblins, the bad guys. And at the dress rehearsal, the night before we opened, everything went wrong and the first leaf man flew out and he hit the tree, giant tree limb and he knocked two leaf men off the tree limb and then he began to spin uncontrollably in the air like this and then the other leaf men flew in and they all ran into each other in the midair and then they were all spinning and then, and then the little kid came flying in and he did great but everybody else was just hanging like in place like dead leaf men and the audience was in hysterics. And I turned to Lampton, not Lampton, um, Stanton, I said, well, we've made a comedy. <laughs> and I'm like, and that's what we're gonna call it. From now on, it's a comedy. And he goes, just calm down. <laughs> we'll see what day. Dress rehearsals are supposed to do that. And so the, the thing premiered. And the Leafman flew correctly. No one bumped into each other. Nobody fell off the set. Um, an editor from Newsweek came down. Three executives from 20th Century Fox came down. And a bunch of people from Blue Sky Studios came down. Um, Blue Sky Studios is the studio that made Epic. So, <laughs> I'm not going to say that this play made them go, let's make this movie. I mean, it, <laughs> they were just like, we're really glad you survived, Bill. And, and it did age me, man. Live theater with a hundred people in the cast will age you like nothing else. And, but it was so much fun and it seemed to bring the community together so well. And even the, Everything, it was so like 
Andy Hardy puts on a show, right? Like the old Judy Garland, Andy Hardy movies, like, you know, none of the kids in the cast could sing, yet it was a musical. Um, I mean, we, we had everything working against us, but there's a sort of sweetness of spirit that rose through <laughs> the traffic, and it seemed to hit the mark. But a few months later, I went to New York, and, with, and met with the, the editor from Newsweek, and we went to see Julie Tamer's new Broadway show uh, called the, the Green Bird. And he turned to me halfway through and he said, I like the Leachman a lot better. So I was like, awesome. Because Julie Tamer just won like 11 Tonys for doing Lion King. So, okay. But this thing kept rattling around in my head. And the guys at Blue Sky, Chris Wedge, the head of Blue Sky, the founder of Blue Sky, and I had made a movie together called Robots, and I think that was happening kind of around the same time, yes, it was, that we were doing this play. And so towards the end of the production of Leafman, I mean of um, um, Robots, he goes, you know, I really like working with you, so if you want to do something else, you need to start thinking about it, because we have to kind of figure out what we're doing next. And I go, awesome, I want to do, I want to do the Leafman. And he said, well, it can't be the play. I want it to be more like a big adventure movie. I'm like, absolutely, I get it. And he and I both had this like love of old Errol Flynn movies, swashbucklers, particularly Robin Hood, the 1938 version of Robin Hood, which I think is the most peerlessly perfect escapist entertainment ever made. I mean, Robin Hood has so much fun being Robin Hood, and he's so good at it, you know? And he, you know, <laughs> every time he like gets an arrow through one of you know the bad guys, chest, it's just it's an amazing piece of work, and it's something very nostalgic for us. So I said I'd really like to give that a shot, and he goes, "Well, go to it." And so this is this is where the threads start to like of how you make a movie start to come together. This you start out with an idea, and then you have to sell the idea, and then you have to make the movie of that idea. So, I come up with the idea, I talked to the, you know, the director, he liked the idea. I didn't have a story really at this point, and I couldn't come up with one, so I enlisted the aid of a friend of mine, um, a guy named Jim Hart, who wrote the movie Hook, and, um, and Francis Coppola's Dracula. And Jim has roots here in Shreveport, his family is originally here from Shreveport. And so I'm like, Jim, I got this thing I'm working on. That's right up your alley. It's all this mythology and sword fighting and just cool stuff. And he's like, okay, I'm in. And so he came down a few times and we're like, what's the story? You know, we didn't want to do the story of the book. We didn't want to do the story of a play. But we wanted to do a story of, that had echoes of Robin Hood. And, you know, we went back and forth, like, who's in trouble? All the things you have to figure out to make a movie story. Like, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? What's the problem? You know, you just can't go, we're going to have a movie and it's set in the woods and there's little people. You know, I mean, there's got to be like something wrong. And so, we banged our heads together for the longest time and then he was pulling out the driveway to drive back to Dallas to go back to Los Angeles. And as he's pulling out the driveway, he said, what if the queen of the fairies dies? And I'm like, awesome. And so, we spent... <laughs> It pulls out and we spent the rest of the time, you know, on our cell phones talking this thing through until he got all the way to Dallas and got to the airport and was getting on his plane. And then we kind of got the movie in, in shape in that one, like, eureka moment. And so, we come up with this 15-page outline of what we think the story will be. And it's a much denser story and bigger story than, the, that what, than what's in the movie. We made an, an epic. I mean, this thing would have been three hours long, easy. And the budget for animated films is roughly a million, a million and a half dollars per minute. So we had written a three hour film, and that's more money than, that would be the most expensive film ever made. Right? So we pitch it to Chris Wedge, the director of Blue Sky, and he goes, I, I love it, it's too long, but I, I love it, I love it. And so, then we go to the head of Fox Animation, a guy named Chris Melodandri, and we go, all right, 
Chris likes this, you know, and we're so here's the story. He goes, ah, oh, that's amazing. I love it. There's too much, but let's just let's just let's just get started. And the only guys that we had the complications of making a movie are so immense, but we we had a leg up in in, in getting in getting it made in a way that Chris and I both had made a movie for them and made movies that were successful for them. So we didn't have to go through lots of different executives that are usual, usually the first line of defense when you're making a film. You start out with junior executives and middle executives and senior executives and you build, you have to go through all these like, like what, torture chambers of executives and you know, one guy would go, I really like it, but can you lose the girl? And then the next guy would go, I really like it, can you lose the guy? You know, I really like it if it had elephants in it. I mean, you just like, you get these, and you're just like, Duh, you know, you're trying to strangle these people, and you're trying to stay true to the story, and you're just hoping they'll like it. But we didn't have to do that. We had to talk to Chris Melodondri, who's head of family films, and the guys who run the studio, Tom and Jim. And so, after we get to a certain point on it, I get Chris Meldoner gives us a year before we show it to Tom and Jim, the heads of the studio. So a lot of the drawings you see in here in this room are drawings that were put together for that presentation to Tom and Jim. And we even like we got into like the character of Dr. Bamba, who's in the, in the movie, who believes in fairies and has been studying fairies. Like we got so into his character that we started building all his little um, his little things that he's found in the forest. So I'm sitting around. It's one of my favorite parts of my job ever. Is making little arrows and little swords and little shields and little helmets out of toothpicks and grapevines and a walnut shell and a pecan shell and some chicken bones and and a piece of some thistle and an acorn, and I'm having the best time. And I'm sitting there with my Dremel, and I got those jeweler's glasses, and I'm just like, damn. And, and, and it, one time I was walking out of the car to take them, or walking out of the studio to take a picture of them in the sunlight, because the light was too dim in the studio. And I got them all resting on this piece of paper, and the wind blows, and they just are gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I'm looking at him like I found a little dead mouse, you know, Gale, but it's a little arrow. <laughs> and I found most of the stuff. But my wife came in a number of times, and she's just like, I'm over there. And she's like, what? What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm making a movie. <laughs> she's like, you were playing. You were getting paid to play. And I'm like. It's a great gig. <laughs> so we make all this stuff. We have all the, we have like we have these little uh, fairy saddles. We have these little fairy we have these good like leafmen ride hummingbirds and uh, bad guys ride bats and crows. And so we had these like crows. We, we taxidermied and we we had built little saddles on them and and we had. Um, uh, a tarantula tank, the bad guys would ride the tarantula inside. I'm incredibly arachnophobic, I'm terrified of spiders. But there I am pulling this dead, you know, mummified tarantula and putting his little saddle on and all his little armor men. And, you know, and his saddle is made out of an acorn seed, I mean, a, 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 a pine tree seed, and gluing it in, and, you know. And, and, but those tarantulas have these little hairs on them. That, they are their defense mechanism when they're alive and when they're dead. That they, they, they get into your skin. So it's just like, oh, this is itching. What's the matter? My fingers all swell up. I went to the doctor I'm like, oh, we think you have anthrax poisoning or something. We've never seen anything like this. Have you done anything unusual lately? And I'm like, well, I've been building this tarantula tank for these bad fairies. <laughs> So there's this moment of like, is this a psychological problem or? And uh, so then she called this, uh, whatever a bug doctor is called, um, entomologist. 
and said, this is what's going on with my patient. He goes, oh my god, tarantula fur. That's the worst. <laughs> Just give him some aspirin and have him call you in the morning. So, so we're making all this stuff. So it's time for to present to Tom and Jim, the heads of 20th Century Fox Studios, Tom Rothman and Jim Giannopoulos. We called Jim Giannopoulos the happy Greek because he was small and he was Greek and he was always smiling and he loved everything we did. And so we go into this thing and it's a year now in the building and Chris and I have been working on the script, I mean, um, Jim and I have been working on the script and I've been making these little things and we've been doing all this hard work to show them the world in what we think will be a very easy meeting. You know, how could they not like this? This is so awesome and cool. We walk in and we start showing the stuff, and they're not looking at any of it. I mean, they're going, because we're going, say there's this guy, Dr. Bamba, and he's found all these things, and he's a real guy. And there are these fairies that they go, fairies? I'm like, yeah, you know, fairies. And I'm like, fairies. I'm like, oh, well, I mean, you know, fairies. And they're like, what's the name of this thing? Leafman, I hate the title, <laughs> said Tom. So we're like, okay. Well, then all these things happen, and there's battles and wars and stuff, and, and, and this hour where we're just pouring sweat, and Jim goes, I mean, Tom goes, so, is, what's this, who's this for? And we're like, well, for everybody that likes fairies, and, you know, <laughs> little kids, and, you know, it's got war in it, you know, and it's a tarantula, and he's like, all right, I mean, I don't know, uh, keep going. So that was our ringing endorsement, the next step of development on this, on this film. And that was like 1990, uh, I don't know, might have been 2000. And yes, it was 2003, all right. So we keep working. And, but you know, we get this kind of like bad feeling in the back of our head, like he hated the title and he just made those weird faces and he look, didn't look at any of our pretty toys that we had made. And so, like I said, you come up with the idea and you sell the idea. Well, we'd sold the idea, we'd sold the idea to Chris Melodondry, the head of family entertainment. Chris Melodondry doesn't get to say, here is a check for a hundred million dollars, go make the movie. Chris Melodondry gets to say, let's develop this film until they tell us not to. That's where we were at this juncture. So we put the script that we had written that was three hours long and we spent a year and a half putting it up in what they call reels, uh, where you do every shot and every line of dialogue and you sort of do a sketch version of what you think the movie will be. And it was like, Chris was like, you know what, I, I like the three hour version, let's just see, let's just put it up and see what we can cut afterwards, because it's, um, it's so rich and I don't know what to cut. So, there were a lot more characters in that version. There was, besides, if you've seen the film, there was, there's Mary Catherine, the teenage daughter, and then there was a, the mother was still alive, and she's come to stay with her parents, She's a teenager, she comes to stay with her parents for the summer. She's her freshman in college, so it's somewhere between freshman year and, and sophomore year. And she does not want to stay in this cabin in the woods with her parents and her new baby brother, Jack, named after my son. And, and then there's a guy nearby named Mr. Dr. Bamba, who has been studying fairies in this, this forest that, they, that they're living in for the summer. It is in, full of fairies and there's a giant war between the fairy factions going on and that they're at the beginning of fairydom that there were um, all the different fairy tribes came together under the rule of King Oberon and there was a sort of round table of the creatures of the forest that um, are water based and they're creatures of the forest that are plant based leaf men and their ilk. The creatures of the forest that are, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the different things. Rock based, element based, I can't remember all this stuff. But there was one group that was that was not 
like a part of the overall scheme. And those were the things in the forest that are parasites. Mold and, you know, scudge and all that stuff that you see when you go in the forest. A tree doesn't look healthy. And those guys have hated being on the outside. They're called Boggins. The leader of the Boggins is Mandrake. And Mandrake is like, it's not fair that we don't get to rule here, that we just exist. And he wants to take over. He wants to be the head guy. And they kill the king of the fairies in Oberon, and they kidnap the queen of the fairies. Um, at that point, her name was um, Titania. And, um, and then the teenage girl is sucked into all of this. She gets shrunk by accident. Because the one thing to birth a new royal of the forest, since King Oberon is dead, is that you must get this, this podling, this little pod, this little flower thing out of the, uh, out of the water of the, the pond that's deep in the forest. You get a podling and you have to take it to the tallest tree in the forest, the um, wizard's oak it's called, and at the full moon, at the full moon, you um, have to have a human baby's laugh right at high moon. As the, you know, so you're holding up this podling and to the moonlight when it gets full, and then you need a human baby to laugh, and that will make the birthing of the new king. And if that doesn't happen, then Mandrake will win and become the ruler of the forest. So, our teenage heroine has to, the fairies come and steal her baby brother, which she doesn't like anyway, but then she realizes she needs to save him. Her parents have been knocked out by the Boggins, the bad guys who have squirted um, um, <coughs> mushroom dust into their faces, so mom and dad are out cold and tripping, and, um, <laughs> and then there's a thing that the, that the good guys, the leafmen, have, um, this little apron full of, you know, some kind of alchemy that will shrink the baby Jack to a size that will make it easy for them to carry to the forest, to get him to this treetop at the full moon. And, but they throw, the, they throw it at the wrong time and they don't shrink the baby Jack, they shrink the teenage sister, Mary Catherine. So now they're stuck in a really unhappy teenage girl who's this tall and her baby brother's still the size of an elephant and they still need to get the big elephant sized baby to the moon and uh, to the tree in time while all the bad guys in the forest are searching for them. So that was kind of the plot. And it was three hours long. We boarded it up and it was awesome and it was three hours long. And so I was like, and it was like, well, let's show it to Jim and Tom and see what they think. And Jim and Tom, this is so, the movie's gonna be so weird. Business can be so odd. We're, we're sitting there waiting to show Jim and Tom, heads of the studio, and we're sitting there, and 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 they're filmed, they're screening another movie that's about to come out uh, there in the theater before us, and it's it's a Master and Commander, uh, directed by Peter Weir, who's one of our favorite directors. And we're all like really stoked about seeing Master and Commander, and so he walks out, and they're slapping him on the back. Tom and Jim are, that's a masterpiece, oh my god, that's the best movie this studio's done in ages. And we're like, we walk over, hey, you know, Peter Weir, we're really excited to meet you, we love your movies. He's like, thank you, thank you, thank you, and what are you guys about to do? We're about to show our movie. He's like, oh, good luck to you. And we're like, okay, thanks. And it's made a tough act to follow, huh? And he's like, well, you know, that's the movies, man. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we go in and we show Jim and Tom our movie, and they don't say anything. Like, there's just this... And then... Tom goes, do you have to call it Leaf Men? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, he goes, and then, and then, and then he did the thing that they do in Hollywood that's the worst. He started to lie. He goes, wow, I don't see any reason why you need to finish this thing. It's already done. It's so beautiful what you've done that I just, we should just release these reels. Those were amazing. And we're like, awesome, awesome, awesome. So we go to a bar to go celebrate while Chris Wedge, the director, hangs back and we'll talk over with them further what next they want us to do. So we're at this crazy bar in, in, in Los Angeles and it's a, it's a vodka bar. And you have to put on these like, like fur coats to sit in this bar because they only serve, like, it's like 10 below in this place.
and they want the, the vodka to be super cold when you drink it. So they put on these, you put on these big like Russian Cossack hats and these crazy fur coats, and you sit at these like incredibly cold tables, and they have these like vodkas of the gods that they come down like like this was the czar the last bottle of the czar's vodka and it's two hundred dollars a shot. We're like, well, we're making a movie. Let's get some of that, you know. <laughs> so by the time Chris Wett shows up, we're you know like we're doing Cossack yells and we're swinging from the frozen you know light fixtures, and he just sits down and he orders like three shots really quick and he's like, fellas, you know it's it's not as good as you think it is. So we're like, what? Is they hate it. They don't want to make it. And I'm like, but they said, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just to get you guys out of the room easy. They hated it. They don't want to make it. So we're like, but we've drank all this vodka. We've got all our, our furs. And I'm like, well, what happens next? And he goes, beats me. And so, like six months tumble by and they don't let us work on anything while they think it over. And then they kind of say, well, see if you can cut it down. If you can get it to like an hour and a half. Just, but you got to get it shorter. So we're like, so that meant, it was really, it was, this is an amazing part of the process. We cut out half the characters and we still told basically the same story. We killed off the mom, we killed off the dad, we merged the dad with Bamba, we killed off the king of the fairies, we just had the queen of the fairies, and it, the story still worked. So we're like, okay, maybe there's hope, and maybe we do this thing. We took it to Tom and Jim one more time, and they said, you know guys, we just don't see it. We can't see spending this money, but you're welcome to take it someplace else. You know, which was kind of a rare thing in Hollywood. That they, if they, what they usually do in Hollywood is they go, we don't want to make this movie, but just in case it's good, we don't want anybody else to make it either. So we're going to kill it, but we're not going to let you take it anywhere else because it might turn out good and then we'll look bad. But in this case, they were so certain that it was going to be crummy and that it wouldn't get made. They're like, oh yeah, you guys can take it someplace else. <laughs> So, Chris and I both knew John Lasseter at Pixar and had worked for him at various points. So, we took Leaf Men, it was still called, to John. And John goes, It's awesome, I'll do it. Absolutely, I like the three hour version. I mean, I love all that stuff. That's great, let's do it. And so, we're all excited. And we, like, the paperwork's getting drawn up. And Chris calls the. Uh, the thought at Tom and Jim. He goes, well, you know, just want to let you guys know, I mean, we're about to sign this paperwork with Pixar, we're going to do it at Pixar. And you're like, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just set. You know? And they flew to San Francisco and did like this intervention. Like, wait, 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 because we have to sign that paperwork too, and we're not going to sign it. So, we'll make your movie. We'll make, we'll make the movie any way you want to. Just don't do it at Pixar. And so we love this movie. Oh my god. Did we, we meant to tell you, we love this movie. <laughs> and so I was just like, well Chris, you know, Chris was gonna have to like leave his company and move. And I'm like, you know, I was just gonna keep doing what I do. I'm like, this is up to you. Where do you want to go? So he's like, I want to go back to the blue sky. And we just I think we can trust these guys. So we start making the movie. Sort of in earnest. And it goes pretty well, and it's it's coming together. It's it's what I'm hoping it would be. There's logic issues here and there that are getting fixed. There's problems with the villain that we never really fixed because once they we took out the stuff about them being left out of the ruling class. I don't know. Never quite recovered. But there was this. You know, it was announced in the trades, and they said, this is when it's going to come out, and we're like, all right, I mean, it's real, they're going to do it, and then about five months before the movie came out, they called us in and they said, we've got great news for you guys. 
we've been working on this like crazy. You're gonna love this. Well, this is one of the hair on the back of my neck. So we're going. The only time they say stuff like that is when they're about to tell you something they know you're gonna hate. Because they're just trying to prime you to feel otherwise. But they said we've changed the name, and we're like, you know, we've never liked Leaf Mill. It just doesn't sound, I don't know, like a movie title. So we've we worked with the marketing people, and we're gonna call it Epic. And we're like, Epic what? And they're like, well, just Epic. See, it's it's see, it's ironic. It's gonna be lowercase Epic. See, it's gonna be a little e because everything's a little. E, so it's sort of ironic because it's Epic. Epic. And we're like, yeah, the American public's really into irony. Here. <laughs> Are you guys kidding? They're like, no, 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 it's going to be awesome. And we're like, no, 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 no. So for about three weeks, there's this whole, like, you can't do this. And we're like, well, we are. And they're like, but, but, but we'll be unhappy. Well, that's your lot in life. <laughs> but it sounds dumb. And like, it's, if you call it epic, people are going to, the first line, every critic's going to go, well, it's not that epic. You know what I mean? You're asking for it. You're like, no, it'll be fine, and the decision's made, and they announced it in the trades, and then we're just like, oh, God. So this movie became epic. <sighs> then Beyonce was cast, and you know, I wanted Kate Blanchett, all right? <laughs> As queen of the fairies. And I have nothing against Beyonce, but I don't know. Then Johnny Knoxville was the bad guy for a while. And they recorded him. He was Mandrake. And it was so horrible. I mean, it was just like, oh, oh. You know, like, I'd rather poke out my eardrums than listen to this. But finally they agreed that yes, Johnny Knoxville was bad. And then we got Christoph Waltz, the guy from the Quentin Tarantino movies to be. So it was, to me I was like, well that's a big jump. <laughs> from, from Jackass to two-time Academy Award winner. Okay. And but they kept calling it epic, epic, epic. That was that I had to live with that. But the thing came out, you know, 1993, 2013. That wasn't so long, was it? <laughs> but in the course of changing the name, my publisher had changed publishers by then, and it was an acrimonious split. And they still had control of Leaf Men, the book. And and they purposely uh, took it out of print just before the movie came out, just to be mean. <laughs> I was just like, well, I think I was, I was right to leave you guys. And so we have some of the few remaining copies that, that uh, leave them that exist, but I got the rights to it back and it's gonna be republished at my new publishing house. And we're not gonna call it Epic. And, uh, <laughs> and so that is how this happened. I was standing in the yard with my kids in a dirt pile. I had the idea to do a play with flashlights. And my kids in the yard, I mentioned it to Pam Atchison. And the next thing I know, we got 100 people in costumes on this grand stage. And then a few years later, or a decade or so, the movie comes out, the end. That's how a movie is made. I think the story of the making is more epic than the film itself. But thank you all for coming, and look around, and enjoy the, the years of work that's on the walls around you from an extraordinary and varied uh, number of talented men and women at Blue Sky Studios, and a few people from Moonbot worked on this at various points. And uh, it is the last feature motion picture that I will make somewhere else. From now on, all my features are in box features. So thanks for coming. Enjoy the show.